feed herself if I just left her in the crib. That's not ownership over your own body, though. The ability to move your body by instinct, even, is ownership over your own body. Okay, so a 22-week-old baby in the womb moves all the time. You're contradicting yourself. You have to have a line. At 15 weeks, six weeks, there's a heartbeat. I guess I would say that... um, Okay, so that was a good point. I'll Thank you. What's up, YouTube? Hope you guys are feeling good. Today, guys, we're back you to a new video. Today, we're going to be checking out Charlie Cook. I call Charlie Kick, because we love kicking ass. Charlie Cook, the Beats College Students at University of Texas. This is a full video. Um, I would love you guys to check this video out to me. You know how it is, guys? Talk less, right? Don't we ask more? Let's get into today's video. All right, howdy, Charlie. Thank you for coming. I'm sure that all of us are so excited that you're here, finally. Um, so before I ask my question, I just got to say this. We need you to come to Texas A&M University. I know, I know that we're here at UT, but I'm not the only person that thinks that. Okay, so I don't remember if it was at SAS 2022 or at America Fest, but I remember you saying that UT Austin is the most leftist university you have ever visited. It's been a few years since you've been here. So, and, and I mean, you can elaborate on this. Is that... Does that still prove true? I know you said UC Berkeley, well, so. Okay, so um, last time I was here, that was something, I gotta tell you. We, uh, we had like a cameraman get assaulted and it was all sorts of crazy stuff. Hmm. Um, that was four years ago. So I don't think this campus has gotten more conservative, um, but I think other campuses have gotten more liberal. So by process of elimination, you're no longer the most liberal school I visited. So uh, <laughs> I guess you'll take it, right? So. No, but I will say this, though, and I'll repeat it. The administration coming in and allowing our dialogue to happen, hosting the event, campus police, uh, that's very good. I don't get that at every school, I got to tell you. We got to fight for every every single inch, and uh, so that's good. I appreciate it. But uh, I said this kind of out in the open when I was there. Uh, There is a lot of work to do here because some of the postmodern pablum that I was hearing, uh, it has some very, very serious implications. So... The, the question, I guess, is also liberal versus leftist, right? Liberal, I'm fine with, okay? Liberals like free speech, live and let live, okay, fine, I'm not a liberal. Leftists really bother me. Leftists are the few people, not a lot, who came up today and they said, you don't have a right to be here, we want to kick you off campus. Okay. Uh, leftists bother me, they're totalitarians and they should bother you too. Instead of having debate or dialogue, they resort to force or they try to intimidate you with you know, threats or they try to play music while you talk. So. There's a difference between liberals and leftists, and um, I hope UT at least remains liberal and never becomes leftist in that regard. Thank you. Awesome. Appreciate Thank it. you, Charlie. Hmm. Um, hi, Charlie. Uh, I just want to open up by saying I am a leftist, and I understand your perspective on this. Thanks them, for being here. But I did want to hear you out today and, well, you know, ask a question. So you said that you believe that quarantine is the cause of our generation's, like, distraught, essentially. And I believe that it is actually war. Like, we were born fresh out of 9-11, some of us around the time of 9-11, and I don't know, um, my father served in Afghanistan, so I don't have a very mm, keen perspective of the United States, let's say, but I I did want to hear you out on what you had to say, and I do believe we have some common ground in the fact that capitalism has failed my generation more than any other in recent years. Yeah, I didn't quite say that, but um, (laughs) I would say lack of free enterprise in some ways, but that's okay, you you got most of it. (laughs) So... um, yeah, so the lockdowns, not quarantine, right? That, that was the word I used. Huh. But I mean, I'll just, I'll prove it to you. So the, the war thing aside, I mean, how many people in this room know someone that committed suicide or seriously harmed themselves in the midst of the pandemic just by a show of hands? Well, that's a lot. I mean, the numbers show suicide visits were 50% higher among 12 to 17-year-olds during the same period in 2018. Psychiatric medication prescription went up. Alcoholism went up, drug use went up, not to mention young people then re-entered an economy where everything was twice as expensive because we created a bunch of money because of the lack of productivity in the lockdowns. And so I think it's just inarguable that the lockdowns made, played a huge role, a massive role in really depriving a generation of the ability to congregate and to communicate. Can I say my perspective? Yeah, sure. Um, this is kind of personal, but I was considering taking my own life before quarantine. And I think discovering myself during quarantine is what saved myself. I have the, quite the opposite experience. I know that is unique in that case. But I would say that it's the opposite. I would say it's the opposite case. But that's just my personal perspective. I think there are far more worse things that my generation has been exposed to than the lockdown. And the inflation that you have cited during the lockdown, that's arguably not the fault of the current standing president, if you do believe that it is the fault of the current standing president. 
Well, right. I mean, first of all, Biden created five trillion new dollars, not created, but he approved five trillion new dollars that was hyper, hyper inflationary. But I'll even give you that the, the other COVID relief funds never should have been approved. But look, it's not just the suicide issue. But first of all, thank you. We're glad you're here. We're glad you didn't make that decision. Life is beautiful and worthy of protection. I mean that. And, but it's from childhood speech impediment development. It's from asocial cues. It's from, if you talk to any psychologist or child psychologist, they do not have the bandwidth to be able to even facilitate the amount of kids. And I know that you have an obviously exception experience, but that is the exception, right? I mean, it is self-evident that these lockdowns were unusually cruel. And you know who they were most cruel to? To poor families. They was the most cruel to people that didn't have extra bedrooms or high-speed internet connection to be able to keep up with this. The kind of zoomification of American education was the hardest on the people that the, the regime said they want to help the most. And, I mean, so you're an economic leftist, is that fair to say? Yeah. I mean, would you at least agree that for one of your passionate causes, which is billionaires getting wealthier, billionaires got $600 billion wealthier. No, absolutely. And, like, your, your whole big, big tech sucks, is that what it says? I don't know what it says. Yeah, but that's, that's one of them. I'm yeah. absolutely on your side with that. Like, and I don't think enough conservatives understand that the left are equally against big business as they are. Well, some leftists, right? I mean, it depends who you talk to. I mean, the, like, the loud minority, I would say, are the ones that are, make you get the impression that we're not against big business. Yeah, but and I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'll just close with this. I, this is what drives me nuts about kind of the fixation on race all the time and all these other issues that I, I would prefer not to talk about is that I think there's actually agreement on kind of how, how things went wrong last couple of years. You blame capitalism, I blame more cronyism and big government intervention over a lot of different things. But I, I'm afraid that a lot of what we spend our time talking about are some of the more superficial issues rated in, rooted in race Marxism. No, I absolutely, absolutely agree. I absolutely yeah. agree. So I do believe classism is the biggest issue in America. Right? Yeah, so let me ask you a question. As a leftist, you know, why is it that the American left why, are, why, are, why is the American left allowing the conversation to be controlled by white liberals that just want to stay rich? It's big business paying them off. It's, it's not. That's an honest answer. That's a, that's a not, you are a true revolutionary. So God bless you, comrade. Thanks for being here tonight. So thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, man. Thank you. If you disagree, come to the line, whatever you guys want. All right. So um, abortion seems to be like a big topic these days. And... I was actually at your booth earlier, I was just listening in, and that was a big topic there too. Um, and so I guess I just had a question about that because at the booth, like, whenever, you were, whenever someone was asking you, like, why, why are we valuing the fetus, it kept coming back to human life. And, um, like, I didn't really understand what you meant by that because when, it, when you say human life, the, like, human life by definition is an organism or a being that has human DNA. And so when the fetus only really has that connection with, you know, like fully grown adults or just like born children, what entitles the fetus to violate the property rights of the mother over her own body or to have the government do so on her behalf? D does that baby have unique DNA? Yeah. So by your own definition, that should be worthy of protection, right? No, I don't believe that DNA has moral value. Oh, okay, got DNA. it. So, so what, when does human life begin? Well, human life, I guess, if you say like, an organism that is human species, by definition, begins at, begins at conception. Right, so then my position is that being that begins at conception is worthy of constitutional rights and but protection. why? What, do, what moral value does simply having, being an organism, even if it's just a single-celled organism, right. yeah. that has human DNA, what moral value Right, because that? human beings are different. Human beings have the ability to have rational speech, to reason, not just consciousness, not just the ability to feel, Human beings are the only species that can not just feel pain and pleasure, but can tell the just from the unjust. Human True. beings are something that is so beautiful and so special, and of course I have many different reasons to believe this, but I'll make a natural law argument, that that DNA will never exist again. It's distinct, and it is living. And if allowed uninterrupted growth, that human being will hopefully mature into something just like you have. And we're all abortion survivors, aren't we? I <laughs> has a point. Tell has a point there. Okay, so you mentioned the, I guess, the rationality that makes human beings special. But that single-celled organism doesn't have that rationality yet. And so what qualifies the entirety of the human species? To Got it.
I so my seven-week-old doesn't have a lot of rationality yet. It, I mean, my, my baby girl eats and does other things and sleeps. Does, I mean, obviously you would agree, it's that seven-week-old has value. Well, yeah, but I'd, I'm not coming from an argument of rationality. I'd come from more of like a self-ownership type perspective. And I simply don't believe that an organism that is inherently dependent, like, on the, on, like, violating another person's property rights in order to survive. Right. So, but, that. I mean, my seven-week-old is very dependent on my wife and me. That doesn't mean I can just eliminate not my seven-week-old. Like, I'm sorry? Obvi obviously, like, the seven-week-old depends on, like, for practicality and living. But if we're talking about a moral perspective, right, just the capacity to have rationality, why right. does that give it moral value? Okay, but we're talking about two different things. I guess the question is, do you believe just because something is dependent on another, is that a reason that you could be able to eliminate that being? If that being has to violate someone else's moral rights in order to do so, yes. Really? Yeah. So what moral rights are, are, or do you mean by that? The right to have like autonomy over your own body. If another actor is violating right. those rights, then yeah, to remove it, I don't see a problem with that. Got it. So, Damn. so bodily autonomy would be more important than another being being able to live a full life. Yeah, I would value a being that has the right to property over one that doesn't have a right to property yet. Got it. Just because the being is older and not in the womb and bigger. And also because the being is a person and not just an organism. Okay, so, but if that being's one week old, it's more than a single cell or organism. Yeah, but that person, that one week old still has like, autonomy over themselves, at least at one week old, like has an inherent like Got it. Okay. natural so, autonomy over So themselves. this is where we have clarity but not agreement. Here's the problem, okay? Morality that built the West and the morality that I'm going to defend tonight is that one week old can't defend themselves, so stronger, bigger people not in the womb need to insert themselves to make sure that one week old is not terminated by people that are just happen to be older and bigger than them is that regardless of size, as soon as that life begins, which you agreed it starts at conception, that being deserves constitutional rights, uniquely and fearfully made. And it's the question of the morality of a society, of what we're willing to do when that being comes into existence. Because human life is special. Human life is different than dolphins. It's different than chimpanzees. We not just have the ability to reason, and I'm going to make an argument you might not agree with. Yes, human beings have a soul. And a soul is worthy of protection. I would even go as far to say that human being is made in the image of the creator. I don't expect you to agree with that. Final point. Okay, so I guess um, I would just believe that the only types of, I mean, at least the only types of humans that can have moral rights are ones that act as moral agents. And a single-celled organism that's living in a womb or a multicellular organism that's living in a womb. Can you right? explain what you mean by moral agents? Moral agency? Well, like, so if you don't have moral agency, then you could be up for elimination. If you don't have, I mean, if you don't have moral agency, if you don't have like the ability to like, if you don't have ownership over your own body yet. Yeah, so that, yeah. by the way, th that is, a, babies until they're about 18 months old do not have ownership of their own body. No, True. I would say that they, would, they do. Okay, how would my seven week old feed herself if I just left her in the crib? That's not ownership over your own body though. The ability to move your body by instinct even is ownership over your own body. Okay, so a 22 week, 22 week old baby in the womb moves all the time. Yeah. It rotates. You're contradicting yourself. You have to have a line. At 15 weeks, six weeks, there's a heartbeat. I guess I would say that, um, okay, so that was a good point. I'll admit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I guess I probably just need to clarify that um, what I mean by like self-ownership or moral agency because that, that, um, that organism or that human whatever, in the womb is still inherent, like, in order to, like, survive, it's inherently biologically dependent, even if it does nothing, right, is in biologically dependent on the mother. And so if we talk about, like, late term, like, just, I mean, like, I guess I don't want to go into that territory just, like, right now, right? Um, so if we say, huh? so, like, if we j just talk about, like, early term, like, abortion, I simply don't see, I, I don't have, like, and I don't think that generally people see a moral value that is similar to even that of a newborn baby in something that is just conceived. We have clarity. Thank you for your question, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Question to you is, my question to you is, 
are you a nationalist? And if you are, do you think nationalism is more means more towards loving your people or loving the ideas of your country? Under the proper description, yes, I am a nationalist. Under the proper description, because I think there's a lot of smearing, and you should always value people more. Great. Thank you. That was the quickest answer here. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Um, I'll start by saying I'm a leftist, but I found common ground with you on abortion and that I completely agree that, you know, whatever you want to call it, a fetus at whatever stage it is, it's alive. Um, First person who's coming out. There's no, there's no positive. contention on that front. My concern, though, and I want to hear your perspective on this, is here in Texas, we have the strictest abortion ban in the whole country. Hmm. There's no exception for rape or incest or for the life of the mother after six weeks. My concern is that the government is mandating that um, people carry out their pregnancies even when it goes against their own life and their own well-being. I can take an example of if, if somebody's threatening to harm you, you have a right to self-defense. Why not have the same, give the same autonomy to people who are pregnant? Okay, thoughtful question, thank you. So. First thing is, if you believe abortion is wrong, which, which you admitted it is, well then, you should obviously have laws that... I'll, I'll clarify, I didn't admit that abortion was wrong. Okay, I then, just then, said, yeah, I see clarify. it as a form of self-defense. Okay, right, so, it, that's a new one. <laughs> well, self-defense. As, as the previous person says, <laughs> that, that, that person inside of you is completely dependent on you in a way different than a, a natural okay. born so, child. So, in most cases, rape and incest aside, how did that being get there? I mean, in, in most cases, through sex, regardless of rape or incest. Yeah, so there was a choice made. I see your point. Even with a choice, let's say you invite someone into your home and they still decide to assault you. Does that mean you not have a right to self-defense against them? Well, no. I think that, for example, if you have a bunch of teenagers over to your home and they start wrecking everything, you shouldn't be shocked when mm -hmm. all of a sudden you wake up the next morning and things are a little awry. But we're not just talking about wrecking at home. We're talking about wrecking your own body, your own personal well, autonomy. Well, hold on. Again, rape and incest aside, of which I'm happy to answer and happy to talk about the moral aspect of that, but 98% of all abortions are done as a form of birth control. Right? True. Sure. It's a form of birth control. How did those people get pregnant? Usually through consensual sex. Right. So they, may, they, they are pro-choice. They made a choice to have consensual sex, mm -hmm. and now they want to be able to use scientific medical technology to crush a being that is not them, is a different person out of convenience? Let's say you have a child who, is, who needs a kidney transplant and you are the only one who can supply it. At, um, and, you, and you consensually allow them to use that kidney. How is it bringing what if the operation just... goes too long, they're still kind of using your blood for months on end? Should the government mandate you know, maybe not kidney. I love these hypotheticals. I, 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 I got it. I got it. Not, not but, making but funny. You see where, no, you see earlier where I got the most amazing hypothetical. I, we don't have to overthink this. Like, why should children get the death penalty because their parents decided to have consent? Some choice. I don't even, understand that. Even, sir, even if you consent to, say, taking care of your child through the, you know, transfusing blood or whatnot, should the government mandate that you have to continue that consensual blood transfusion? Again, under the unrealistic hypothetical, and I reject the whole premise of it's, this. The question is, let, 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 let me answer it more day. broadly. Do I think the government should step in to protect and preserve human right, if uh, by be it by mandating, especially when the question is termination or not? Of course the answer is yes. yes. But it says a lot when I, there's a, there's a very serious concrete question and kind of we have to yield to these abstractions, which is fine, the philosophical sides and the kind of the hypotheticals are fine, are, are legitimate, I suppose, in some sense, but it comes to be just more concrete, right? Mm -hmm. We've got a million abortions every single year, okay? Mm -hmm. 998,000 of them are because of a form of birth control. Do you find something wrong with that? Not necessarily. Okay, I think there is something wrong with that. I think that just looking at the last resort to be able to terminate human life as a form of birth control it's not just sick, it's immoral, and it says a lot about who we are as a people and kind of the folding of, culture, the folding of a cultural life in our nation. And so I'll just ask one final question. When does human life begin? It begins at conception, but that doesn't override the right to bodily autonomy and self-protection. Okay, so that's interesting. So you, you, it does begin at conception. So does that mean someone who is larger than another being has the right to terminate them? Because why, why is it bodily autonomy? Just because the being is in them? The, the size doesn't matter. It's, it's the self-defense. If 
it, self defense if again. If a toddler is running a knife at you, you can knock it down. You know, it's you. I'm 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 sorry. I'm kind of impromptu here as we That's keep okay. going. That's okay. Yeah. Well, so I'll just close with this. Um, don't use that analogy again. Yeah. No, yeah. that was a that was a bad one. <laughs> Thank you for being here tonight. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, um, thank you so much for coming out here and for like facing disagreements first, I guess. I really appreciate it. Um, all right, I had another question coming up here, but I really, I, the bait is there and I have to take it. Um, okay. <laughs> so I am also pro-choice and I was wondering how, um, like you, you said um, to the previous dude back there that um, the government in cases where human life is at risk, should step in through any means necessary, be it through mandates, be it through bans, things like that, right? Again, that was a hypothetical answer. Let me clarify it. I think Please, the government yes. has a moral obligation to protect innocent life when confronted with the question of someone intervening, intervening to end that life. All right. So if a police officer standing idly by and he sees someone on the side of the street and someone is going by to about to kill them, the police officer being an agent of the government has a moral right to intervene. I'm sorry, I do have to take like a little bit of a caveat here. So the behavior of the police officers in the Uvalde shooting was disgusting. Oh, I totally agree. Do you believe? Okay, yeah. sweet. <laughs> but guess what? I'm consistent. The cowardice <laughs> that happened at Uvalde is the cowardice we allow to happen when there's a million abortions in our country every single year. All right, <laughs> okay, okay. Which is okay. There's a point standing right idly there. by when children unspeakably get massacred. True. Uh, I don't know, I think there's a bit of a difference and the analogy that I usually use or the question that I usually ask pro-life people is um, do you believe that the government should mandate organ donation even in cases of like things like donating your kidney or right now we have a policy where even after death if you know you have like religious things where you have to <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, no. <laughs> Where, you know, your whole body has to be intact in order for, like, burial rights and things like that to happen. We say that you shouldn't have to donate your organs, but the pro-life case seems to extend to the idea that even people who are living should have to give up their kidneys to people in hospitals, maybe, who need kidneys. Well, I don't quite see it that way. Um, okay. but what I'll makes a uterus different? Well, first of all, Sorry. again, in 99.67% of the cases, the woman made a choice that could potentially... And what about those 0.4%? What do you think should happen then? Oh, I think the baby should be delivered, of course, because I'll give you an example. Let me just prove it to you. If I had two ultrasounds, and one of them was a baby conceived in rape, and one was a baby <laughs> conceived in consensual sex... Well, of, of wh course. Which one is it? <laughs> they, they look the same. I, I do, I, I do but understand But you can't tell because they're both human beings. Oh. And in, in Western morality, of which I'm defending tonight, doing something wrong after something evil... It's never the right thing. So do you True. think that government should mandate True. organ donation? No, and I think it's a false equivalency How for, so? more, for more reasons than one, for a lot of different reasons. By, by the question of do I think the, the government should come in and protect innocent life from being slaughtered, of course I do. Yes. And that, that's the answer. So, I mean, when it comes to mandating organ donations, I don't even see how that's applicable to the question. Because in 99.6% of the cases, 6-7% of the cases, the mother made a choice to be able to get pregnant. Now, in the very small micron kind of case, then the case is that the, the, human, the human life and the human being needs to exist. So it needs to be, able to be able to exist. All right. I'm going to argue that different forms of birth control have, um, like, different forms of, like, effectiveness. And someone can, could be, like, potentially on birth control using those control mm -hmm. methods and it fails, is that just a risk that like, someone Yeah, so I, I'm going to say something. Th this, is, this is how far our morality has gone. We need to teach kids to save themselves for marriage. And True. a lot of these problems wouldn't be having. And if you do decide to engage in consensual marriage before, sex before marriage, and you get pregnant, that's the cost of the game. Mm. All right, okay. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Okay. He's actually my friend. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> um, I actually first heard of you through a Christian apologist I follow called Dr. Frank Turek. Yeah. He's um, special. He's great. He's, he's awesome. He's a great friend. Um, my question concerns the hope and love we can have for America 
I mean, we, we live in a country that has allowed for 63 million deaths through the abortion industry, and we have multiple industries and institutions that are built on lies and lust, and it seems as if the majority of American citizens either don't care or even approve of all of this. So where do you think we can go, the individual people, the church, and the government, to where can we go from having hope and love for our country at this point? It's a very dark picture you painted. Congratulations. <laughs> do you have anything else you want to add to that? Um, well, first of all, you know, I assume you're a Christian. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's, it's up to us Christians. There's two things Christians can't be, apathetic or cynical. I won't put up with it. You're secular, you can be apathetic and cynical. You're a Christian, I'm not going to put up with it. Because you know how the story ends, and you have a great hope, and you should always be working towards a great end. You should care about your nation, Jeremiah 29, 7, demand the welfare of the nation that you are in, because your welfare is tied to your nation's welfare. Daniel fasted and prayed for his nation. Nehemiah, Jeremiah, Esther, Mordecai, uh, all cared about First the wealth. Timothy, too. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Pray for your leaders by name, because um, mm -hmm. they're counselors to the king. And so, look, I think we have a lot of hope, and the hope is not in the institutions, it's not in the FBI, it's not in the DOJ, it's not in the CIA, it's not in Facebook, it's not in Google, it's not in Goldman Sachs. My hope is in the energy and the spirit and the optimism of you. Hmm. I mean, what I get to see in the American people traveling the country, hosting a national radio show, hosting a podcast, I'm nothing but hopeful. The, the spirit in the grassroots of the American people right now, of all ages and backgrounds, is so awe-inspiring. And it doesn't take a majority. It doesn't. It takes 10 to 15 percent of a vibrant hopeful, spirit-filled group of people that can turn things around. And, you know, we as Americans have done great things, and there's something special about America. I will defend it at all, at all corners. And the thing that, one of the things that makes America different is when something bad happens, we step up. Is that we, we have it, True. you know, in our history to not be apathetic. We have exceptions to that rule, obviously. And my hope is in what I'm seeing across the country. My hope is in pastors rising up. My hope is in people that are starting to speak boldly. My hope is in parents showing up to school board meetings and challenging what is being taught in these local public schools. My hope is parents that are homeschooling. My hope is in our Turning Point USA chapter leaders that are starting these chapters, that are in the grassroots, that are on high school and college campuses leaning in. That's what gives me hope. The institutions, here's the cool thing about institutions. They come and go and they build and they crumble. But the spirit and the will of the people, I think, is stronger than any other time I've been doing this in one decade. And I think that resolve is only going to strengthen. So right. God bless you, man. Thank you. God bless you. you. That was good. Hi, Charlie. I'm Jamie, and I'm actually from New York. And I was one of the only conservative people in my school. So it's really cool to see you talk here. <laughs> Um, my question is, since we live in a world where big tech and digital tracking of payments and information dominates the avenues to being social, attaining many jobs, and being in academia, do you think in my lifetime we'll see a world where cash is obsolete, and how do I protect my privacy of personal, personal information, such as vaccine status, while still being able to stay social and attain a corporate job and perhaps also enjoying other luxuries in which releasing this information is required? Yeah, well, that, that's a great, great question. So let me kind of tell you, it's hard to do all those things, right? <laughs> it's going to be hard to keep a corporate job and also keep all of your kind of medical information private because for whatever reason we decided to throw out HIPAA and ask everyone for their personal medical information about the vaccine, which never should have been allowed in my personal opinion. Um, but look, as far as the currency question, it's a very important question. What PayPal announced and then what PayPal attracted should just scare everyone regardless of political affiliation. Where PayPal came out and they said that if you engage in their defini definition of disinformation, they're going to take $2,500 out of your account on violation. Now, they backed away from that, but this is a company that did $25 billion in revenue. How on earth did they ever get this approved through, you know, how did this get on a press release? How did this become policy? Uh, you just saw today, you might like him, you might not like him, you might think he's great, you might think he went too far recently, but Kanye West just got a, uh, an alert from J.P. Morgan Chase, he's no longer allowed to bank at J.P. Morgan Chase. And that's wrong. I don't care what you think of Kanye West. Mm. To be able to shut somebody's banking system off because you don't like them, or because they say something that you, you, know, you deem to not be appropriate. Um, and so there's something very troubling about that. And so how do you protect against it? I don't think it's the end-all, be-all. I don't think it's a solution to everything, but I am a big fan of cryptocurrency. I think that blockchain properly employed can be a great hedge against tyranny. Um, I think that the federal government is trying to make us cashless soon, and we have to resist, and I'm telling you, resist very loudly against the federal government trying to put forward a federal digital currency. It's a very, very big concern. It hasn't gotten a lot of focus on it. 
but a federal digital currency is a very big issue. We've already seen the intentional debasing of our currency. I don't agree with libertarians on a lot of things, but the one thing I'm 100% on is the destruction of our money. Hmm. I have to tell you, the Federal Reserve intentionally coming into our money system and creating money out of thin air and making you poor year after year after year through quantitative easing is something that we should all be very concerned about. I'm afraid they're trying to get us closer to a currency reset. reset. And so part of it is just owning assets that, assets that can be moved quickly, that are transparent. Um, that's one of the things that excites me about Bitcoin. Again, I'm not telling you to buy Bitcoin. If I did, I could get in trouble like Kim Kardashian did. Do whatever you want to do. I don't care. Um, I think it's good technology, and I think, I think crypto can solve some of these problems. But their agenda is trying to get us to go cashless. Hi, Charlie. I'm here with a group of students from the UT Pro-Life Club, so we're really thankful for your pro-life stance. Um, my hmm. question is about like phone addiction and sort of this switch to transhumanism that's going on in our culture right now. It's really worrying me with um, my generation that we're so addicted and um, we don't even realize it. So I was wondering your perspective. Yeah, that's a really, really great question. Thank you for your advocacy. The pro-life group here deserves a lot of credit because sure. based on what I saw today, you guys are up against a lot. Yeah. Uh, Seriously. Yeah. It's great. Uh, I'm not a fan of our digital pacifiers that have seemed to permeate our entire society. Um, I really believe that we are participating in the largest and most cruel open-air drug experiment in human history, which is to give these devices to 12, 13, and 14-year-olds. There's some really great thinkers on this, not political. You could just read Dr. Anna Lemke. You can go read uh, Andrew Huberman, who I think is really smart. He spends a lot of time here in Austin. And they're very fair, and they're very well-cited and researched, and they just talk about the neurological damage that staring at a phone will do, especially at a young age. And I, I look at it no differently than giving kids drugs. And so the one thing, and I wish that Marxist, I don't know if he the leftist was here, and I wish I would have said it, I would, I would also say, and this is, if you want to talk about one of the great hockey stick correlations and not get too ahead of yourself, if you look at suicide and depression, or just kind of what would be a, kind of like a basket of how you would define mental health and like how you'd say, okay, good or bad. It went up like a hockey stick in 2013 as the iPhone was widely distributed. And again, I'm not a big causation correlation guy, but it's like, come on, what else could you possibly attribute? Like what has changed the most in our day-to-day -day interaction at a restaurant in the last 10 years? Let's just, just be honest, right? I see entire families out to dinner and no one's talking to each other. I think it's deeply unhealthy. I think it's antisocial. And it's not even governmental or po uh, political in, in, in nature. So, I mean, just some stats I have here. 26% of car accidents are caused by smartphone usage. 31% of smartphone users in the U.S. never turn off their phones. 45% of children's aged 10 to 12 have a smartphone. 45% of teens feel addicted to their smartphone devices. It's bad for both boys and girls. It's especially bad for girls. I think TikTok is one of the worst things ever to come across the American um, technological landscape. I really do. And it's okay if you're addicted. I know some of you applauding are probably addicted. That's fine. I understand. Um, and so just some, a final piece on this. I turn my phone off Friday night to Saturday night. I encourage all of you guys to take a phone Sabbath once a week. It's very freeing. It's awesome. It's a challenge, too, because you've got to kind of figure out how to, where to, how to get directions and where to go. It's really fun. And you could do it. Just take one day a week and turn off your phone. Within three weeks, all of your friends will know you're unreachable by phone from Friday night to Saturday night. You'll be in a grocery store, and you like, won't know what to do when you're waiting in line. And you're like, wow, this is how it used to be. It's very freeing. <laughs> and just the final thing is this. I'm far from an expert, but if you read Dr. Anna Lemke's book, Dopamine Nation, um, you will have a picture into how, how horrific the damage we're doing to give these kids <laughs> devices. Uh, there's other books as well. Gary Wilson wrote an unrelated book, but important, especially for young men, Your Brain on Pornography or Your Brain on Porn. May he rest in peace. He was a great thinker. But there's like this whole new genre of scientific thinking that I think is legit science, by the way, of people that are a little ahead of the curve diagnosing what I think is going to be 10 years from now. What, we're going to look back like, what were we doing mm -hmm. giving all these kids devices? So you still have the power to turn off your phone. I know it's hard, but uh, it's doing huge damage to young people in particular. Thank you. Appreciate it. OK, so I'm uh, one of the first agreeers. All the, all the disagreeers are first. So, okay. um, but anyway, uh, one thing I don't think is pushed strong enough by the pro-life is adoption. Yeah, I agree. 
um, because, uh, I mean, that kills it all entirely. There's so many families that want to adopt kids, and if you see a show like Long Lost Family, you see these people that reunite with their biological parents 20, 30 years after they're born, and they live wonderful lives, and they have two sets of parents, and it's a wonderful thing. So if, you know, this whole discussion on, oh, the, the, the mom is going to be, you know, live a terrible life, she can't afford to have the child, but there are, I think, something like 30 families for every one child that's adopted that want kids. I think it needs to be pushed stronger, you know? I totally agree. And, you know, I want to shout out my friend who runs a great clinic in San Antonio, who does a phenomenal job for the pro-life movement. And by the way, the, I, I know we don't like the term crisis pregnancy center, right? It's not our favorite term. But, um, you know, Dave McCaw does such a great job. And I got to tell you that the people that are on the front lines of this deserve a lot of credit. Elizabeth Warren says she wants pregnancy crisis centers to be shut down. Yeah. which is unbelievable, yeah, but, but I'll say this, and I think you're right, and I didn't, I didn't make this point clearly enough earlier at the table. If we are going to advocate an end to abortion using the state or government, then we have to be there to make sure that every single child is taken care of through charity, through churches, and through resources necessary. It's morally imperative we do that, and adoption is that first step. It, God bless you. Yeah, sorry. It, well, no, I've got, I've, I, I've got more, because if you, if you read Peter Zion's book, I mean, uh, China's population is going to collapse in the next 20 years just because of the one-child policy. Um, I mean, we need to have kids. Your nation dies. The population, you know, the population collapse is coming here in big time. Um, well, we're, he, according to Peter Zion, we're doing okay, and there's, we've well, got immigration too. I agree with Elon Musk. I think uh, we're— you, th you think it's declining? Okay, yeah. but we need to have kids regardless. I agree. Regardless. God bless you, man. But, okay, but I, but I got one we, more we got to get to another one. Oh, I'm sorry. No Thank problem. you. No Thanks. Hi. Sorry, we're short on time, sir. Sorry. Hello, I'm asking a question for friends. If I sound stupid, this is not on me. Okay. Uh, so let's agree that like abortion should be banned and this is the government's right to protect uh, you know, the rights of kids and whatnot. And so we see a lot of statistics where kids going into foster care homes or things of that nature tend to be abused or sexual abuse to a certain extent. So what would you say is the government's solution uh, and role in this whole situation. Yeah, I'll piggyback on the kind of question previously, which is we have to change the way we do adoption in our country. Um, I would, again, a lot of people find this to be you know, terrible, but I will lean on this. I think we have to lean on the church uh, who has the infrastructure and essentially these parachurch ministries, and they have the willingness to be able to do this and to support uh, adoption. There are two million people right now that want to adopt in America. Two million people. And I bet that would double or triple if the pastors of this nation really challenge their congregation to lean in and to adopt. If you're going, you, if to be consistent as a pro-life person, you have to come up with solutions. And the solution should be, we have to make it financially easier to have children. We should go maybe as far as Hungary goes, which yeah. is to pay people to have kids. I'm not against it, I'm not. We should go as far to make sure that adoption is easy and seamless. And then we also have to individually and charitably step up to make sure that this idea of an unwanted pregnancy is a thing of the past. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I know you. Yes, you do. What's up, man? What's going on? Great Ever final question. Yes, yes. Quick question. You said we should stop talking about racism, but we have a problem in the country. You're not a racist. Thank you. As often as I've been around you, you've never said anything that has been racist, but the left, they constantly say that you're racist. And if we don't talk about the problem that they're trying to create, it will never go away. Yeah, so what I was saying, and I think you'd agree, I'm exhausted with talking about race all the time, right? But, and I, I'm happy to also push back on, like, who's actually the ones that are being racist? And the people that are pushing black-only dormitories in America, that's racist, exactly. right? The people that are saying that we should have value on skin color and not content of character, that's racist. And so I'm just exhausted about talking about it all the time, honestly, because I feel as if when you focus on those issues, like, man, we're just constantly talking about what divides us, right? And I think you understand my heart in that way. Exactly. It's, but it's only the left that's constantly pushing yes. that. They're constantly pushing it, and I get it all the time. So yeah. thank you. God bless you, man. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> all right, everybody. This was a lot of fun. A couple things. Support your Turning Point USA chapter. They're doing an amazing job. I want to thank UT for hosting us nicely. Really appreciate that. Closing note, we live in a beautiful country. Do something about it. Make sure you're registered to vote. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for tonight. Just make sure you're registered to vote. Make sure you vote. A lot of people gave a lot for you to be able to vote in this country. Be an True. informed citizen. Stay engaged. Stay involved. 
America is the greatest nation ever to exist in the history of the world. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. This was amazing to watch. I love the entire debate. Uh, when it comes to abortion, it's really a serious topic. I love how Charlie handled the entire discussion. I don't know why um, children should take accountability of the or oh, to be bad children, to take accountability of um, people's actions who got pregnant, who consented to um, have sex, and they, the action leads to pregnancy, and they choose to abort it, and they are blaming the um, baby in them, in the woman's um, belly, the fetus, they're not blaming the fetus, or how they call it, yeah, the fetus. I don't know why they're blaming them. And they just want to get rid of them. Every single one of us in the entire world, we are abortion escapes. We escaped abortion. We, as, we all escaped miscarriage. And our DNA is totally different. Every single one of us, our DNA is different. We are distinguished. So you telling me that a baby um, in a mother a fetus, let me call it a fetus because it's not yet out yet. But I see it as a baby too. A fetus should be aborted because he, um, he or she is not fully grown or matured or delivered yet. Should be aborted because they're still a cell or they're fetus. They don't have rights. Makes no sense to me. Because they never choose the baby in your stomach or the fetus in your stomach never choose to be there in the first place you concepted with a partner 90 percent of um people concept before the formation of the babies <laughs> is being formed 90 percent so you concepted with a partner and you ha both have um sex and now you there's a baby growing inside of you and you want to get rid of it because you feel like it's not the right time and you don't want the baby it's not yet alive it's not yet delivered yet makes no sense it's 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 stupid and uh, some people some some people get the idea to blame the baby that is in the woman's stomach already the unborn baby it makes no sense that dude right there is said a word that was very 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 hostile and very harsh and abrupt he used the word self-defense you are defending yourself against the baby. The baby never chose to be there in the first place. You concepted to have sex. It's your action that led to the baby, unborn baby in the, um, in the woman's stomach. It was your actions. Now you are using the word of defense. Defense in what way? Tell me. Defense in what way? It, 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 it's really silly when I hear such conversations such words like it's it breaks me down and it's very very hurtful for me to hear such word uh, it's it, there are hurtful words because if you take a scan right now and scan a baby as according to what charlie said both parents concepted and they were not gotten through rape and the one that was gotten through rape they both sound the same way why is because they are living beings they are human beings that are yet to be born they both have distinguished DNA. You won't tell the difference which one is raped or which one is not being raped. So it's it's really heartbreaking when I hear some people using some harsh ways like defending yourself against the baby. A baby that did not ask you to concept to have sex. He or she did not choose to be born. He or she did not choose They did not ask you, he or she did not ask you to start the formation of, uh, of the child himself. Because, like, abortion itself, just pure choice. It breaks my heart when I'm hearing them saying, um, my body, my choice, my body, my choice. You choose to agree and mate with another partner. And your actions have consequences. That's what this generation fails to understand. Every single one of your actions have consequences. Either being good or being bad, there is consequences. Your choices, the child in your stomach 
have nothing to do with your choices you made. He or she that the ch- he or she did not ask you to form him or he or she. I don't know how to explain this in a very very much clearer form. But the baby never asked you to form him or she. You choose to concept. I love how Charlie answered all of them, all the students who were there. I love how Charlie handled this. Um, the discussion was really, really meaningful. And Charlie was very, very smart in his answers. And he, he was also pained by some people's weights of choices, how they were calling babies, unborn babies, by their weights. This is, this is really serious, guys. This, this world, this generation we are in, we have to look to the bright side. We have to stop glorifying uh, promiscu- promiscuity. I should have pronounced that word. <laughs> should stop glorifying casual sex, sleeping 5,000 people, <laughs> five people, sleeping with 10 people. We should stop glorifying such things. Then when you're asking, you have slept with five people, or six people, or 10 people, leads to a baby and you want to terminate the baby. Like, it's, it's it's very stupid. You don't want to take accountability of your own actions. You want to just get rid of it. You, you see a baby that you have actually formed already as a problem that you want to solve and terminate. It's, it's very, very harsh, guys. It's very, very harsh. And you see such people who um, do such acts and choose to terminate the baby and get rid of the baby. When they see little babies who have been born, it's a cute, cutie pie, sweet, lovely. But you concepted to get rid of one that you should have born. That is a funny thing. They're, they're, this generation, we are very... We are hypocrites. Like, the, the hypocrisy is really, really high. We are, we are hypocrites. It's very, very hard. It's very, very bad. Like, I just pray for... I just pray. I just pray that this generation see the light and turn from the wickedness of this world and and look through the bright side. Millions of babies are dying every day through abortion. Millions. And a lot are coming from black families. And these are not being talked about. They're not being talked about. Comment down below and think about this video. Give us a thumbs up. Share this video to as many as you can. Subscribe to our channel. I will see you guys in the next video. Make sure you stay safe. I just bought a bag. Like an old lady. I'm back. Wood smoking. I don't own papers. Pass that 808. That don't, don't shake her. Oh, bitch, you know I'm grinding like a pro skater. Baby, mama bugging. I'm so quick to hit ignore. Buku bitches in my bed. I got scales all